transmitting high atop of Florida's peninsula at 108 feet. This is Alpha Mike, and you are listening to Raider Cop Podcast. Today's episode 193. Admit nothing, deny everything, and make counter accusations. As we go towards the world of policing the police, better known as internal affairs, we'll look at it in the perspective of a subject officer. You know, the guys that YouTubers get all the time with their cell phones. And we'll look at the philosophy behind internal affairs in a lot of agencies. Some of it is good and some of it is not. As always, how do you contact us? Well, there's two ways. Well, there's actually three ways, I'm sorry. RaiderCop.com. There you can hear all our podcasts and RaiderCopNation.com, which is our official website where you can get more information on us and future podcasts that are coming. Also, you can hook up with us on social media. Now, I'm not going to go through the array and the list and what they are, but we're not really on the communist ones anymore, with the exception of Facebook for now. On Facebook, you can catch us on Raider Cop Nation, just that simple. But today I want to talk about Gab, G-A-B. You can find us there also as Raider Cop Nation. This is a social platform that our president, Donald J. Trump, picked recently to do some social media. So, hook up with us, us there. Readjustment of the podcast, as you know, we're on three times a week, uh, which is Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. Now, I'm not going to get into the platform. You know, there's seven platforms that we have, but we... Uh, that is from January all the way down to we get down to the end of April. Then we transfer that and we start coming up with a new format, which is a little bit less than what we're doing. And I'll explain that real quick. So, we're going to go all the way down to April 28th. That will be our last show where we have the format that is the three days a week. And then we start May 2nd, episode 224. Then we'll go twice a week. And it's going to be launching Sunday nights and Wednesdays. Sunday night. And Wednesdays. And it's a little bit better. And the reason why we're doing it is because not only the large amount of work that needs to be done. And um, it, it, was, um, it was a good idea on paper. We'll just say that. And not that it can't be done. But I don't want to do a lot of shows where research and development suffer. So... We decided that we're going to bring it down to two a week. And um, and we'll leave it like that for the remainder of the year. Trump, Donald J., has been acquitted by the Kangaroo Court of Congress. They wasted our money. They wasted our time. If you saw the Bolshevik news... You heard them saying that he was guilty and he would be found beyond a reasonable doubt guilty of these treasonous charges that they came up with. But what you really witnessed was a bunch of babbling buffoons that, sadly enough, a lot of them say that their occupation is lawyer. 
scary because they tried to find a man guilty not presenting any sensible evidence, not tying the charge to the evidence, and just babbling, babbling, and babbling. At the end, anybody with a sane mind would have said, what in the hell are we doing here? And they ended up acquitting him. Now, of course, we have seven on the GOP side that somehow they saw some different type of imaginary evidence and they voted to impeach him. Now, what do I mean by not ta- not tying the evidence to the charge to the evidence? Well, they charged him with inciting, inciting one count of the inciting of right. And then they started showing videos of him in rallies and stuff like that. Now, anybody with half a freaking brain and a computer with Google search on it will let you know what an insurrection is. And here they kind of didn't even look up the definition. But they were rambling about things in the past and never really tying it to the event of what occurred in the Capitol. And uh, when they did decide they were going to stretch this out, the Republican go. The Republicans basically said, "Well, we don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But if you're going to do this, this is going to go on for months, and we're going to start petitioning people too, like Nancy and Chuck. Yes, the two major clowns in the circus were going to be petitioned as well." Because, you see, they're in charge of the capital security. What did they know before, during, and after? (laughs) So they rethought it, I guess. But maybe they're bringing it back up. I don't know, and I don't really care, because I didn't follow any of that crap on the media. Because it was boring, and it was not a... Look... Here's something for the coffee table when you're with your friends. And you guys want to talk about this. Just say, hey, listen, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court refused to judge this thing because it's it's a kangaroo court. So that should tell you everything. All right, enough of that nonsense. Now it's time to go into the sensible world and the world that gives you power and enlightens you, the Word of God. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 John 5, 14. And you can hear more of this later on down the road when you can pick up the word series or what we're going to start calling A Wall Monday. And that, of course, A Wall Monday was started in, in May. And you can hear this, it'll be less than 30 minutes, the powerful word that I just read. What exactly does it mean for your spiritual upbringing? It's important to know, and uh, we, we encourage you to listen. And uh, on another program note, Uh, Somebody had asked, what are we going to do with all those um, tapes? They're not tapes, but broadcasts that we had done on Test Everything 1521 if that site is no longer going to be up. 
And um, we are going to start publicizing those as well uh, on this venue. And those are 15 minutes or less. So we've got enough material just with that, probably to last us several years. But we know that the Word of God has been positioned for that exact moment when you need to listen. That exact ear will pick it up and God will use the messenger, the vessel he sees fit to carry it out. Today's episode, we are going to talk about a sensitive subject in policing. The people that police, the police, they've gotten two letters as their initials, I and A. They're known as internal affairs, and in cop circles, they have some other names for them that we can't really use on the air today. We're going to take a dive into the perspective of an officer meeting internal affairs. So it's time to get everything ready for the main event. Episode 193, Admit Nothing, Deny Everything, and Make Counter Accusations. Admit nothing, deny everything, and make counter accusations. Episode 193. Now, in order to make sure that you don't, are not tortured, we're not going to talk about the history of internal affairs. But internal affairs came into play in policing when let's say citizens started to become concerned on police action and confidence in the leadership investigating or passing judgment on some of these officers after a complaint was filed wasn't there. So the legislative acts in city, towns, states started to give that power to the police department so they could police themselves. Today, a lot of people still think that that notion is ridiculous. But not really understanding how it works. A lot of citizens pass judgment immediately by saying, well, you know, they're not going to do nothing to the officer." But that might not be necessarily true. It depends on the agency. What are you trying to say, Alpha? Well, what I'm trying to say, and what I am saying is, the mentality of the internal affairs investigators will be determined by the leadership of the agency. It trickles down. If the chief is no nonsense, I want this dealt with, then they're going to have that hard-nosed mentality. But if the chief is one of those, we need to look out for our own, and we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt, then those investigators are really, really going to roll up their sleeves and do their job. So there's two forms of seeing this through a negative eye or through a positive eye 
So to avoid the history of internal affairs, we'll dive into it. It is the section of a department where they will police the police after an accusation has been submitted to the agency of malfeasance of an officer and that complaint can come in the form of another employee, another officer, a citizen, or an employee of the state. And then the agency would have this formal bureau, section, department, division, depending on the size of the agency, that they would immediately pull the records of that officer and start the investigation. <clears throat> and, of course, question and place the complainant under oath. That would help. Now, sometimes these process are good. They're not necessarily bad. Sometimes internal affairs investigations are bad. As I said earlier, it depends on what I, you're looking at it, and who's looking at it. From the standing point of an officer, when you're called and told you're a part of an investigation and you need to either contact your lawyer through your union or prepare for an interrogation or whatever have you, and you find out about it, it's never a good thing because your mind will start to race, especially in today's society where everybody has a camera. Now, it doesn't mean that the officer know. oh, my God, they're going to find out that day that what I did. No, but nobody likes to get judged either through the lens of a camera. So it brings a lot of anxiety to the officer. The good thing is that the complainant thinks or feels they're going to solve this case and they're going to find that officer guilty. They'll fire him. They'll throw him out of there. They'll place him in custody and they'll never do this to anybody ever again. Maybe. Maybe not. Sometimes the outlook is unfounded, but it is so important that that investigation was done that it has enlightened the agency in a huge gap they might have had in their policy and because of that incident now they can address that in policy or it could be in training so not every investigation is bad some of them in the smart departments use them to their advantage to make a better agency. Now, somewhere along this, along this line, the leadership of internal affairs, okay, will come about within the agency, okay? Depending on the size of the agency, maybe the person in charge of internal affairs is of the high rank of sergeant. Or it could be a big agency where the rank of the person in charge of internal affairs may have deputy chief or colonel or major or some higher ranking position. That all depends on the magnitude of that, the size of that agency, the and how much they have invested in their internal affairs section. But regardless of internal affairs, it's all about the leadership, the person on the top, as I said earlier. That mindset is what will dictate how internal affairs will operate. Yes, they'll look at different avenues. For example, if the person is accused of 
violating somebody's rights. And that would have maybe some criminal behavior behind it. They would look at it as twofold. One, criminal. Two, uh, dialect of the policy. They deviated from any written policy and therefore they're subject to an administrative review. So they look at it twofold. The administrative review part is what the leadership of the agency sometimes like to see because they like to see if their policies or their procedures hold water. When it's criminal, they might even team up with the neighborhood district attorney or state attorney and looking at if there's a possibility of criminality in, in whatever evidence that they come up with. But now there's a hands-off list. Now, of course, if you call your neighborhood police or corrections department in the area that you live in and you say, can you please give me the hands-off list that internal affairs have? They'll tell you you're crazy and hang up on you. We don't have any such list, but they do. And that list is the do and don'ts, the have and have nots. In the agency that probably will never come under scrutiny by internal affairs. But if they were to come under scrutiny by internal affairs, that case would be tippy-toed around very carefully like you're walking on eggshells because of the person they're investigating that works for the agency. Every agency has a list. They might say they don't, but they do. It's just human nature. There are some units that get more complaints than others, and they get complaints because their specific unit is a very tough unit. <coughs> Excuse me. They work in the tougher neighborhoods, and they are resisted the most, and they're dealing with, let's say, an example, narcotics, for example, and you're doing little diamond bust operation. Well, mostly you're doing you're doing these in uh, plain clothes, and the guy's going to run, and he's going to resist, and uh, there's going to be complaints. That's just an example. I'm not telling you guys on narcotics are on some list. So the hands-off list exists. Usually those lists are discretionary up into the chief of the department. Let me give you a little example. Officer or Detective XYZ has been filed a complaint on such inappropriate behavior or conduct. The conduct does not appear to be uh, anything against another employee or anything sexual in nature, let's say. But there might be some civil rights or criminality in that behavior against a suspect. But that unit is very special within the agency. And therefore, the individual appears on the hands-off list. As such, that those investigators are going to have to go all the way up to the chief and say, this is what we got, what do you want us to do? Sometimes those chiefs might be of the position as have no report of anything, I'll handle it myself. Could happen. Give you an example. A friend of mine, of course we won't name him, but he was, during the 80s, 
an undercover operative doing uh, I'm part of a DEA task force and he was doing drug buys in South Florida, Miami area specifically. He's dressed up in his drug dealer outfit with beeper. Back then it was a beeper. For the young man, man Ellie, who was listening, they don't know what a beeper is. It was a device you placed on your hip, usually on your belt. You looked hip as all can be. And it would beep, 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 beep. That means somebody wanted, they were paging you. You'd have to run to a phone or a pay phone and call the number that beeped you. There'd be a number on the screen. <laughs> Technology, huh? Today we have cell phones. But back then, he had his beeper, his brick cell phone that only drug dealers used because it was like, a gazillion dollars a minute if you used it. And he was driving either a, a Lamborghini or something similar to that, he told me in the story. And he's driving down a road in a certain city in Miami on US 27. And in the course of in his undercover role, they are DEA agents and other officers. This specific individual was not a DEA agent. He was actually, I believe at the time, a sergeant in another police agency. He was assigned to the task force. So they were using him for his skill set in knowing the local area. And uh, he gets pulled over by several police officers in a city. And as soon as he gets out of the fancy car he's driving, he's immediately given a good shot in the stomach by the officer that pulled him over, took his breath out. They proceeded to take him to the back of the vehicle to open up the trunk. They wanted the money and they wanted this and that, you know, a list of demands and we're not going to put up with you. And, uh, they proceeded to uh, bounce him around a little bit. At the end of the day, they took whatever was in the back. It was money. I don't recall the amount of, he told me it was. And they drove off. Then the DEA came in. And they had this huge mess on their hands. So, obviously, the operation that they're undercover has to continue. So... This gentleman now has to be on a hands-off list. You have an active investigation. You can't blow that investigation to go get these cops. But the officer, or the undercover operative at the time, the DEA told him, what do you want to do about this? And he goes, well, I'm not pressing any charges and I'm not cooperating with what they did. I don't work for internal affairs. That's their business. Now, of course, the DEA had an obligation, and when they thought it was safe and convenient, they did present it to that agency. There was a pr pretty bad film, I'm sure, but they had film of it because the, it was under surveillance. And um, the deal that they had worked out with the agency that the officers would be terminated. Then they had another deal with the state they were never to be rehired in another agency or surrender their police certificates. That was done quietly. Nobody was on the list. Got it? Now, the officers that did that, there weren't anything important not to be on the list, but due, due to the circumstances, they were not on the list. So what are the some of the techniques officers can use in these investigations. Now, before I dive into some of the techniques an officer can use, let's, there are some dirty tricks departments use. And I know this from experience because I worked for one. And they came up with this cockamamie rule that 
if there was a complaint against you, they would investigate it. And once they came to the conclusion that something wrong was done, they were presented to a panel of executives in the department and they would rule guilty or innocent. And if it was guilty, what their recommendations were for punishment. There was no real cross-examination and all this other baloney. They would find you guilty. They would tell you you're going to get three days. And then you would, in turn, were given the opportunity to give a statement if you wished. You were also threatened, well, we wouldn't appeal this if I was you. I'd just take it because if you appeal, it can get worse. And all this nonsense was actually happening. They lost probably, and I don't have an exact number, but I do have an exact quote from one of the union representatives. Over 90% of the cases, they were they were horrible. They were losing. And if they didn't lose them immediately, they would lose them on appeal. So in other words, they would actually pass judgment against the officer. The officer would be given three days, five days, whatever the sentence was. And then it would go into an appeal process. Months down the road, an arbitrator was brought in to hear this. They had no ties to the government. And they would listen to how the judgment was passed. And they go, you guys for real? I mean, there's, there's nothing here that's even resembles lawful. And of course, they were overturned. So it was mind-boggling, but they would do it. So those are the dirty tricks that the departments would do. Now, oh, let me explain this too. When you get the three days and the five days and all that, it's no pay. So you go home and you don't get paid for that length of time. Which also means if you're not in pay status, you've got to cover, like let's say your insurance, you got to come out of pocket with that. So you get double whammy. And those are days that are taken away from your retirement, right? So you have to work 30 years, 25 years, 20 years to your retirement. Well, guess what? You got two weeks? Well, you got to make up the two weeks because you didn't work. You weren't in a pay status. Okay, got it? All right. So some of the techniques that can be used by officers and uh, I used them myself and I thought that they were very effective. The first one is let me give you this, uh, the scenario. You come in they verify that it's you as you walk in uh, they go through a list of name, date, uh, badge number, date of birth and all this other stuff and I'll explain that one in a minute too and uh then they kind of present what they're going to do briefly. They put you in a room. They go get their recording device, stenographer, the whole nine yards, and come back in. And then the investigator will start the tape. And they'll basically say, today is, and they'll say the date and time and all that. And then you have to state your name for the record and blah, 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 your badge number and all that other stuff. And that's the beginning of the tape. Now, remember, this is evidence, right? Interrogation is evidence. So you can't just destroy evidence. So one of the techniques used commonly by yours truly was after the investigator went through all that nonsense, about 30, 35 minutes of that baloney, I'd wait for them to turn on their little recording devices, talk into today's date, this and that, but... And as soon as I got a little opening that they were catching air to go do their next breath and speak into their little recording device, I would say in a louder voice, sure is cold in here. And they'd look at you dirty and they go, shh. Then they turn it off. And they go, hey man, you, you can't just, you gotta wait for me to fit. Oh, I didn't know, I didn't know we had a script. Okay. Now, you can't destroy evidence. That's part of the evidence. I just said that the room that I'm being interrogating in 
in felt cold to me, uncomfortable. Sometimes we go through the whole baloney, the whole scenario, and it was my turn to talk, and I would say, can I use the bathroom? That'll get you dirty looks, too. And eventually, they got the point. The answers to the questions, yes, no. That's it. Not true. Got no knowledge. You wouldn't go on and on about it. Be very careful with your words. Now, a lot of people might say, well, that's not fair. You know, you must have been doing that because you were guilty. No. Many of these things, you were not guilty. You were being picked on because you were there. You didn't do anything. They'd actually, in some cases, ask you a stupid question like, let's say they had footage, you know, video. And they would say, can you identify the officers that are standing around next to you in this video feed? Well, why should I be placed in the position to identify them? You know who they are, but this is the game they play. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a match. And sometimes I never did it. I never got to those, that level, but I have heard of other officers and supervisors that were being questioned and they would say, I'm in the video. Where, where am I? They'd switch it right around on them. So those are some of the underhanded techniques. And the number one underhanded technique is exactly the title. Admit nothing. Did you on such and such a day? No. Deny everything. Me? I did that? You're kidding. I didn't do that. And make counter accusations. Now that's a difficult one. But here's a common way of doing this. Well, when I first started in law enforcement, the old timers used to tell me, just pull them over. You don't have to call it. And I'm just giving you an example of something. So you would always blame it on yesteryear. Back when the policy never existed. The Stone Ages. They had no record of it. It pissed them off. It meant nothing. Deny everything. And make counter accusations. The counter accusations, the investigator had to cover the counter in the investigation. In other words, they had to go find out well, what you just did or said. Was it true? And it became a process. Where would, where is internal affairs going in the future? Sadly, I believe that it will become more complex than it is today. We noticed this in police shootings. For the last four or five years, agencies now that they might have investigated their own police shooting, if they were large enough, now are pivoting to another agency to do it for them because of the accusation. So they have been going to the state's let's say state police to do the investigation and it becomes very awkward but these are in police involved shootings and police involved shootings that involve homicide as well and I believe that in the future all internal affairs will be handled by some other entity completely out of the control of the agency but remember, I gave you some examples on why certain things have to be dealt with differently. Not everything is a conspiracy. Not everything is a negotiation with Ukraine and Russia. Some things are for the safety of officers that do things on a daily basis. Like, here's a good one. 
great officer infiltrates the Mexican mafia and makes the biggest, at the time, drug bust in Florida. And through the mechanism of the department, his face is plastered on the newspaper. The agency revealed who he was. He was an undercover operative. Long story short, today, he's a lieutenant. They blundered that one big, but it wasn't a mistake. So the nastiness sometimes is in the department itself. But not everything can be just so nicely put in policy and fit everybody with the same shoe. Sometimes things have to be dealt with differently. My buddy Jake used to say it all the time. That's the first time I ever heard the term admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. He died after serving 34 years. He lasted two years. That was his favorite line. When I came in, that was the first thing I ever heard him say. Admit nothing, deny everything, and make counter accusations. These goofs will never figure it out. And he was right. Up next, the Solomon Report is awesome. Episode 194. You're going to enjoy that one. That's part of the Buccaneers series as we continue the Hardy's list on RaiderCopNation.com. We're going to explain the Solomon Report. As always is, it is my honor to be your host on Raider Cup Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, your community, for the law enforcement agencies that serve you. And most importantly, continue to pray for the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike and I am out.